Welcome to Business Infrastructure, the podcast about curing back office blues of fast-growing businesses. If you're a business owner or operator looking for practical tips and solutions to scaling your business in a sustainable manner, you're in the right place. Now, here's your hostess, Alicia Butler-Pierre. Hello, it's great to be with you today. I'm Alicia, and joining me from Salt Lake City, Utah today is Damon Burden. Today's episode is brought to you by Equilibria Incorporated, and this season is all about profitable processes. And Damon is actually going to share with us the processes that he used to build a fully scalable agency while improving quality control. Damon, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you. Hey, Alicia. I'm looking forward to chatting. Thanks for having me. Yes, and I I know I'm especially looking forward to this conversation because I know you and I have kind of been chatting through LinkedIn for a few months now, and so I've eagerly anticipated this opportunity to chat with you. Now, you've built a wildly successful seven-figure agency called SEO National. Can we first start off with you telling us a little bit more about your company? Yeah, so SEO National, SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. And if you're not familiar with what that is, it's a form of online marketing. And and the goal with SEO is to show up higher on Google and other search engines for words that you can monetize, but without buying ad space. So, you know, when I started the company, you know, maybe we'll get into the background here in a minute. But when I started the company, at the point where I started diving into SEO, I said, SEO is going to be my thing. We're not going to be one of those agencies that kind of says they do it all and then is mediocre at all of it. So we're just going to focus on strictly SEO. So that, that's that's our core product. Okay. And you've been in business now for, it's 13 years or 14 Yeah, we're years? just a couple months short of 13 years. Yeah. That's amazing. Congratulations. I'm sure it's been a very interesting journey. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm sure we'll get into some of that. Yes. Yes. So actually, just to segue into what we're going to be talking about, the processes that you've used to really scale your company. Now, there are a lot of people who talk about growing and scaling a business, but it's very rare that we have people like you who are willing to actually share the processes that you use to make that happen. So can you start off by first... Tell us, in your opinion, what does scale mean and look like for you and your company? So for me, when I, why don't I give you a little bit of backstory of, of where I really started to dive into scaling and documenting processes. So years ago, probably seven or eight years ago, I had a VC company approach me and they said, hey, you know, we see what you're doing and, and we're interested in, in buying your company and merging it with another marketing company that does different types of marketing and then blending them together into this, you know, all in one company. And so I went through those discussions to kind of fill it out. You know, it was exciting to have somebody approach you unsolicited. And I ended up backing out of those discussions because it just didn't feel right. But I learned two important things. And what I learned was that when a company wants to buy you, they want a business that is turnkey. So they just want to come in, take the keys and and drive away. And then the other thing that they want is they want to say, hey, where's all the sales and leads coming from? Where's that fire? We just want to go pour more fuel on it. And so at that point, you know, I, I had all of, kind of had half of that, but I, I had processes, but they weren't formally organized. So half of them were in my head, half of them were on spreadsheets, half of them were just in different places. And so after that, I said, I should really formally document these. And then at the same time, I was also starting to read e Revisited, which is just like the perfect storm because it's, that's what it's about. It's about, right. <laughs> you know, making your business not dependent on you and making it dependent on processes. And so after that, I sat down and and built out those processes. And that took a long time, Um, but it was the best thing. So it was like the the best thing and the worst thing. Like the part that was hard about it is I already had a successful company. And so on top of running the business, being a husband, being a dad, then I had to figure out how to go through and document everything and start to finish again. And so that took probably two or three hours a day, maybe two to three days a week for a year. It took forever because... What I did is I said, if I'm going to do this, I want to do it right. And I, I never want to do it again, like the whole thing. Obviously, you got to adjust as time evolves. And so I personally went through every single step and potential process that we could do in any of our products or services and redid it from the ground up. And when I documented it, I wanted to do it in a way that I could bring in somebody new and they had no background on the process and they couldn't screw it up. 
So as long as they could read and follow directions, I could say, go read this, follow those directions. And I would be confident that their, the quality control was, was still retained. So that's kind of how I got into it and, and how I started going through those processes. And, and as you asked, you know, what does that mean to me? Well, well now the beauty in it is, like I said, the bad part was how long it took. And, and that was not fun. <laughs> so, you know, but, but now that it's done, it's the best thing ever because every time we have a new client, I just go push a couple buttons and it kicks everything out to my team and I know they're going to nail it. And two primary examples of the fruits of that labor are the one example that I often give is, you know, maybe two years after I did all this, we had a big client come to us and say, Hey, you know, we, we want to sign up, but the scope of our work is, you know, this, and they were an international company in a really competitive market. So we had to do a lot. And that meant I had to hire a lot of people. And so I was able to, you know, after going through the interview process, finding the talent, then after that, it only took three days and, and we were running because, you know, day one was, Hey, welcome to the team. Day two is here's our project management system, get familiar with it. And day three is I assigned them the projects and I let them go. I just said, do your thing. So, you know, that's one quantifiable benefit. And then another recent benefit is, you know, just a week or two ago, my wife and I celebrated our 13 year anniversary. Oh, congratulations. So, thank you. And so we took our kids and we went out to Hawaii. We, we, that's been on the to-do list for a long time. We finally went out to Hawaii and I could comfortably do that. Like I, I didn't have to have any concern that the entire operation was running smoothly in my absence. That is very succinct and it falls in line with everything that I've been talking about since I've started my podcast. It's been a little bit over a year, but I'd like to go back a bit, Damon. Can you talk to us about how you actually identified which processes to document? Because I'm trying to imagine for the person who's listening to this right now, they may be thinking, oh my gosh, where do I even start? How do I prioritize all of these processes that I know I need to document? Yeah, so it'll vary a little bit by industry. So the abstract way you can start is exactly what you said. You know, where do I start? Well, what are you doing that day? So literally anytime you're doing anything, especially if you're ever going to do that thing again. And so even now that we have the, our core processes documented as search engine algorithms evolve or new, new processes are introduced, as I'm doing that the first time, right then and there, if I ever think I'm going to have to do that again, I start documenting it. And so as you're going through your day-to-day processes, if there's any systematic concept to it, then document it. And even if it's something that you know that you do firsthand and it's just second nature, I would still document it because down the road, if you introduce more team members or even for your own quality control sake, then you can just reference how to do it. You know, maybe you're having a late night and (laughs) you're running low on steam (laughs) and you need a little quality control refresher. Um, And some Red Bull. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Just so as you're doing it, just do it. But um, it, it, for me, where I started was SEO. There, there's hundreds of tasks that are involved when you work on a website, but they fall into certain categories. And so that's how I chunked it out is I said, okay, when we okay. launch a new client, we first do research. And so part of our processes is here's the competitive analysis and keyword research phase. And then after that, it's content strategizing. So what are we going to write about? How frequently? And what are the topics? And how are we going to close that knowledge gap? So I documented how we come up with a content calendar. And then what's the reoccurring process for us? And so there's a certain reoccurring scope of work. And so I documented those. And, and oftentimes I have people say, well, my job is so variable. There's, right, it, it just right. changes, which is true to an extent. But oftentimes you can still document the concepts. And so maybe, you know, for us, all of our clients are different, but I can still document the process of of how we do competitive analysis. I'm still, even though their competitors are totally different and their targets for us on Google are different, I'm still going to research them the same way. Mm -hmm. And so usually you can find some consistent part of your processes and as far into this game as I am, I still every once in a while go, okay, I got these couple new things and, and I, I don't know how to process them. And then I kick myself and I go, of course you can just like, don't rush into it, sit on it for a day or two, figure it out and, you know, just wait and, and you'll just let it run through your mind and you'll figure out a way to document it. Now, when you mention documentation, are you writing these processes out in the form of like step-by-step procedures or are you mapping out flowcharts? What does documentation actually look like at your company? 
So for us, we use a project management system called Insightly. And within Insightly, you have what's called activity sets and then projects. So what the activity sets are is kind of like I said, the chunked phases. So keyword research might be one activity set. And then within those activity sets, there's individual tasks. And so when I documented it, I went through and created a task that is exactly like you said, step by step. Go to this website, do this, go to this section, click on this, record this information, save it in this file. And then if I say save it in this file, then I create that file for my team and I already have that template saved in Dropbox. So I say, click on this Dropbox link, clone this file, follow the steps in this task to populate that file. And so you chunk it out for us in those activity sets and then you assign those activity sets to overall project templates. So for us, we have, you know, we may optimize a website that's a retail client and then a different project may be for a service-based client. And so our project templates in Insightly are identified in that manner. When we board a new client, I go into Insightly and I say, launch a new optimization project for a retail client. And then I select that from our documented processes and that'll kick out different tasks than if it were a service-based client. Interesting. Very interesting. So do you find that what well, sounds like your staff, they're already used to going into this tool. And so they, because they're already in the tool, it's very easy for them to just access these processes, right? Because I hear a lot mm-hmm. of people, oftentimes another concern is, okay, well, we'll go through the trouble of documenting these processes, but then it just kind of sits on the proverbial shelf and collects dust because no one's actually reading the process. But it sounds like, the, is that a challenge for you all or, or no? Not in our case, because our services are, you know, technology based. I could see that being a bigger issue for a physical labor job where you have to go read the documentation and reading that is separate than actually doing. And so for us, it's kind of one and the same because when they log in, it says, go to this website. So they have to go to that website to complete the project. It's not like in maybe a warehouse where it says, find this product and move it over there. A lot of the the move it over there in this safe manner, the warehouse laborers might just know to go grab the product and move it, but they they might not follow the safety procedures during that movement. So in in keeping in line with business infrastructure, since obviously that's what this show is about, for those who are listening for the first time, business infrastructure is simply just a system for linking your people, your processes, and your tools so that your company can grow in a profitable and sustainable way. And so what Damon is speaking about is all of these processes that he's identified, he's documented using this tool called Insightly. So Damon, are there other people within your team now that actually also document processes? Are there a few uh, key people who are responsible for doing that? Yeah, it depends on their their individual tasks and responsibilities. So my team is largely hired based on their skill set. So I hire... Obviously, we cross-train, and and most people are aware of the benefits of that, but I tend to hire based on one or two skill sets because I want my team to enjoy what they're doing, and so I'll usually, as I'm I'm interviewing potential candidates, I'll say, hey, not only what are you good at, but what do you like doing? And that may be something Mm. totally different than what they're good at, and so I try to task them based on what they like and they're good at. And so for that reason, my team tends to work on um, very specific scopes of tasks. And so as those types of new projects come into our environment, then I will task the, the most relevant team member. Um, I actually just got back some, some documentation today from one of my team members because you know Google came out with, with a new option for webmasters. Um, I won't bore you with what it is, but I said, hey, so this was most applicable to one of my team members named Sheila. And so I said, hey, Sheila, here's this link. Go read this new thing from Google. Here's what I would like to understand about it. Can you provide me back the documentation of how we do that thing? And so I said, I'll give you two or three days to figure it out. And then she came back and she gave me a, a screencast video. And I said, great. Oh, that's can-. awesome. Yeah. And so then I said, after I watched the video, I said, that makes sense. That's, this is what I wanted. Now can you also reproduce that in a text format so I can put it in slightly? Ah. Uh. I'm glad you mentioned screencasts because another thing that I tell people is they get flustered at the thought of having to actually type something out. And I tell them, just do a quick video if you can get away with doing a video. And it's it's a lot easier sometimes to update a video than it is to update a, a very bulky manual, for example. So I love that you said that. Yeah, I think that that will also vary because like you said, video is way easier. But I think you probably want to 
that decision should be based on the length of time the video is going to take to create. If it's like a 30 second thing, then yeah, do videos. A lot of our stuff is kind of a mix. Some of the documentation is very lengthy. And so if I was to convert that documentation into a video, it might be a video that takes me a half an hour to recreate just to change like one bullet point halfway down. So in that case, it doesn't make sense to do a video because I could just go in and change that one line in the text. So it depends. I think they're both valuable. And sometimes what I'll do is, is I'll do both. I'll do the text-based documentation. And then at the end, I'll say, click here for an example. And then they can go watch it if it's more complex and actually see the process. Now, as Sheila captured the video, did she just use some type of transcribing or transcription software to convert it into a text file? You know, I don't know. I just, I just messaged her back and I said, hey, can you give me a text version? And, and she just gave me a text version. Okay. Well, for those listening, that's also an option if you don't want to have to actually type everything out. Let's take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsor. When we come back, Damon, I'd love for you to offer some advice to those who are listening and they're, they're still maybe thinking this is such a daunting task to offer any advice that you might have. Equilibria Incorporated is an operations management consulting firm offering products and services to help fast-growing small businesses scale with less pain. Visit eqbsystems.com for more information. And we are back with Damon Burton. Damon, you were describing to us your process for how you've scaled your company, SEO National, into a seven-figure business. What advice would you offer to those who are listening right now who are still thinking, gosh, you know, I'm listening to Damon. It sounds great. I know that it's going to take time to get it done, but I just can't seem to get myself motivated or where can I even go to for help to get my processes documented? I would just say just start anywhere because one thing that I found interesting about going through that process is that it becomes exciting, at least for me, because then I could start to see the the results and the potential results. And so it almost became addictive. And and I think that's part of why now, um, anytime I have a new, new task I'm working on, if I realize I'll do that again, that I go ahead and start documenting it because I, now I actually enjoy the process just because I've I've been able to quantify those benefits. So I think once you start, it'll start to make more sense. And then probably more importantly, you'll realize that it's not as daunting that you think. It's definitely more of a mental game, but I mean, you are the expert already. So it's not like you need to go figure out how to do what you're trying to do. You just need to figure out your best method to document it. And so for me, I took a while. As I started documenting it, I, I just started in, you know, Word docs just to, to get the concepts figured out of how I was going to structure this documentation. And then after I realized, okay, I need, I'm going to need these type of features in a CRM or a project management system. So for example, I needed the ability to have the CRM to have reoccurring tasks. So some of these tasks are, are not part of a, a greater project. Some of them are just individual reoccurring tasks for a client. And then they just do that. We just need to do that one thing and we need to do it every quarter or once a year. And it isn't dependent on other things. And so I didn't want to have to set a calendar reminder to go in and assign this one-off task. And so as I looked at project management systems, I had to make sure that it had the, the ability to add reoccurring tasks. So start somewhere, start figuring out what you'll potentially need in your CRM features, and then go play around with CRMs. A lot of them will give you free trials. And then once you start looking into paid models, there's a huge difference in the prices. You know, when I started with Insightly, one of the deciding factors wasn't that it was free for a single user, but that was a nice advantage. And so for a lot of the listeners, if you're just running solo, then find something that's free. And then as you begin to scale, a lot of these will scale with you and, ha- and give you price discounts based on the users. But, you know, for example, Insightly, a, a paid user is 10 or 15 bucks. But then if you compare that to, gosh, I don't even know, Salesforce. Salesforce, um, yeah. Yeah, you could end up being hundreds of dollars. Right. And you may not need something that elaborate. Salesforce is amazing, but it's like, rocket science. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Enterprise level. (laughs) Yeah. So so play around and figure out what you need. Uh, A lot of my clients and good friends that have also found success as entrepreneurs, they like to use Trello. Trello is more more visual and drag and drop. But for the advantages that Trello had, it had some things that I needed that it didn't have. Uh, And so it's going to be on a case-by-case basis. Okay, so you've mentioned Trello, CRMs like Insightly, screencasts for video capturing, capturing processes, maybe initially in Word documents. Are there any other tools that you would recommend? 
Uh, let's see. Based on us, um, I'm, I'm trying to think the, the bigger picture that would be more applicable to anybody because um, there's a lot of tools that are specific to the SEO world that wouldn't be applicable to listeners. One tool that I, I personally use a lot for, for organization is that, um, I'm on a Mac and I use a, a program called Things. Things is really useful for me. So with my, with my team, I use Insightly. And then for my individual non-team overlapping tasks, I use Things. Uh, the reason why I use Things is because it synchronizes with your phone. So there's a, a desktop version and then there's a phone version. And so the, the example I always give is, you know how when it's late at night and your your mind's running and then you, you remember something comes in your mind, and you're like, oh, as I'm dozing off, I hope I remember this in the morning. And so right. then like you ruin your sleep <laughs> yes. because you, you wake yes. up like five minutes later and go, do I still remember that thing? <laughs> yes, all so, the time with me. <laughs> yeah. So I use things and then I just, you know, I roll over on, on the nightstand, grab the phone and I punch in whatever the thing is. And then like I immediately clear my mind because when I wake up, what I input on my phone is going to be on my laptop. And ah. so it automatically puts it there. So when I, when I fire up the computer in the morning and I pull up my task list and things, whatever that nighttime thing is, is it's just right there. So things has been really useful. And then um, I actually really have cool. one other, there's one other good app so a lot of people are really surprised at how I balance my time. And what I mean by that is, is I've been married for 13 years. Um, I have three kids. And so I'm a huge family guy. And I schedule my time accordingly. I'll give you a couple of examples. So 8.20-ish a.m. to 9 a.m., I block off my calendar. So if it's a, a nice warm day, I can walk my kids to school. And then I do the same thing at, you know, 3.20 to 4 o'clock so I can walk them home. And I connect my calendar to a, a scheduling system called Acuity. And I think it's the same one. Yes, you yes, yes. Yeah. I love Acuity. Yeah. So on Acuity, uh, it pulls that time block from my calendar. So my clients cannot, I have these time blocks where like that's family time. And so you can really systematize your availability instead of having to go, oh, I can't, you know, an appointment comes in and then you go, oh, shoot, you know, my kid has a soccer game or an assembly. And then now, now you're in that awkward, uncomfortable position where you either miss out on a kid's thing or you have to tell a client like, uh, hey, I need to reschedule. So you can really systematize that with, without even having to have that awkward, proactively preventing those scenarios. The other app that we use is my team is all decentralized. We don't have a physical office anymore. And so we use a VoIP phone system called 8x8. It's just the number 8x8. And the reason why I like 8x8 is because we can have the physical desktop lines that are connected to the internet, but I can still hit you know, extension 2 and page my team and call them as if we're in a physical office. Hmm. But the better part about 8x8 is they have a phone app. And so where this blends into me bringing up family is... If I want to sneak out and go grab lunch with my kid in the middle of the day, but I still want to be available for the family reasons mentioned, I don't give out my cell phone number. And so 8x8 has an app that connects to your desktop phone. And so if the clients call in, I can answer it on my cell phone as if it were the office line. But then I can also call out from my cell phone without exposing nice. my cell phone number. Hmm. And so then you can set automatic rules on there that says calls are only allowed to come through between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., turn them off on the weekends, whatever, whatever works for you to like have that separation that you need to stay focused, you can systematize that. How long would you say it took you to truly scale your company? So you've, you've identified the processes, you started documenting them, you started hiring more and more people, training them on the processes, landing larger clients. How much time lapsed, would you say, before you truly scaled? Was it a year, maybe two to three years? It was more than that. No, because when I first started my company, I was 23, 24, something like that. And so I was really young and uh, it was just cool to be self-employed. So for the first year or two, I was just kind of riding that high of, of hey, I, I accomplished something and I'm self-employed and, and, it, and it, it was satisfactory. And so probably closer to the two-year mark, I said, hey, I got a good thing going here. We're getting good results. And I had systems in my head, but since it was a one-man show, I really didn't need to document them at that point. And then I said, I should probably do something with this. And so that's when it first got into my mind where, hey, I should turn this into a company company, not just 
you know, and it, 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 it was registered with the state and the IRS and all that, but it was just a one man show. So it probably went to two phases. So that was kind of like the first phase was that realization, like, Hey, I should do something with this. And then the second was, I guess, three phases. The second phase was maybe at the year four mark. I was listening to E-Myth Revisited on Audible, or not E-Myth, um, Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. And a lot of that stuff was common sense or I had already kind of been exposed to. But the one thing that I really took away from that book was at that time I had one virtual assistant, one BA. And when I was done listening to that book, I said, why do I only have one? And so mm. within two to three months after that, I had, I think, four or five. Oh, wow. And so I really started to go, okay, what reoccurring things and tasks can I comfortably assign to somebody else? And so that's when I started to get into scaling and then the, the loose concept of documentation. And then that third phase was the story I told you about the VC investors. And that's really when I went all in. And that was probably about the year six or seven mark. Okay. Do you know roughly how many processes you all have now? Holy crap. Yeah. It's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Just to give some context here so that those who are listening can know, you know, and obviously the number varies depending on the company and the industry that you're in, but just, just so that people can have some type of an idea of what they may be looking at. We have around 250 documented tasks. And then those tasks are grouped into probably 50 to 60 activity sets. And then those activity sets are lumped together with probably 20 different types of projects that we can launch. Okay. So an example of, of projects for us is we may have a client that is in a retail industry that runs on a WordPress website. And so if they use WordPress for their back end, we integrate different plugins and feature enhancements. Then we may have a retail client that is on Shopify, so a totally different backend. So we have to do things differently. We take those same concepts. So here's a good example of things being diverse. But regardless of the different backends, we still have to improve the page speed. So we go to the same places to identify, you know, we use the same tools to identify what is tripping up the page speed and how can we improve it. And then depending on those results, we go into the backend and adjust it accordingly in different ways. But then we may have a non-e-commerce client that is on WordPress. And so then we do these different things and we don't go through the updating the e-commerce component because it doesn't exist. So that's an example of, of the different projects we launch. And then the activity sets within those, you know, the page speed might be one activity set. The keyword research is a different activity set. So we segment them all into very clear chunks of, of responsibilities. I like the way you describe that because it also speaks to the fact that there's no one right way to do processes in terms of documenting them and how you store them. It's really all about making sure that people know how to do their work, right? And that yeah. the results are consistent, whether you do the work, whether Sheila does the work or someone else on your team, as long as the output is consistent and the quality and the value is still there. That's what really matters at the end of the day. Exactly. Yeah. The, yeah. You, you nailed the word quality control. That was my main goal was to feel comfortable tasking other people responsibilities and maintaining that quality control. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, we've come to the end. There's so many more things that I would like to ask <laughs> you, but unfortunately I can't. How can people get in touch with you, Damon? Yeah, I appreciate that. So seonational.com is my company website. I often blog about entrepreneurial life at damonburton.com. And if SEO is, is something of benefit, I have a free Facebook group. It's not a funnel. I'm not sneaking a sell squeeze out of you. If you go to ways, <laughs> if you go to ways to rank.com slash Facebook, it'll redirect you to that Facebook group. Okay. Can you repeat that ways to rank.com dot com. Some, slash Facebook. And, okay. then, and then that'll take you to the long Facebook URL. It'll redirect you. Okay. Awesome. And for those listening, you definitely want to, to follow Damon. He has, his clientele includes several Inc. 5000 companies. He's worked with different NBA teams. He's also worked with several businesses that have been featured on Shark Tank. He's a highly sought after speaker and consultant. So definitely make sure you reach out to him. Damon, thank you so much for being on the show today. Okay. 
Now, Damon talked to us about the processes that he used to scale his company over several years and how it led him to building his seven-figure empire known as SEO National. He started out with just figuring out what processes do I need to identify? And the best way to do that that he suggested is that you take a look at the things that you're currently working on, especially if it's tasks that you are repeatedly performing. That's a great place to start in documenting your processes. Next, just actually document it. Even if something is second nature to you, you have to keep in mind that the people who are coming after you, i.e. the people that you will be hiring, it may be their first time doing something. And so you want to write at a level of detail such that that person can perform that process without having to rely on your day-to-day -day assistance. Another thing that I love that Damon said is that you want to figure out how to categorize the tasks and different activities that you perform in your company. One way of doing that is to think about each of your tasks or chunks of processes and figure out what can actually be standardized. Even though there may be a great deal of variation in the work that you're doing, there probably are some elements that you can actually standardize with the caveat that there will be some customization depending on the client or customer that you're doing the work for. He also walked us through his scaling journey. He told us how that kind of happened over three phases. Another thing that I thought was so key was that one of the major benefits of documenting processes at SEO National was that it enabled them to land and keep big clients. So when you have these processes and you're growing your company, you need to hire more people because you obviously cannot do it all by yourself. Damon did not remain that one man show. He had to hire more people, but when you hire people, they need to not only know what to do, but how to do it and processes answer that how. It also enabled the people that he hired to ramp up their onboarding really quickly so that they could literally hit the ground running. Another thing that he shared with us were several different types of tools. We'll make sure that we have access to the links to all of those resources in the show notes at businessinfrastructure.tv. I definitely recommend, again, that you contact Damon. The best way to do that is on his website, seonational.com. Again, that's S E O national.com. You can also find him at Damon. Burton.com. That's D like dog, A M like money, O N like Nancy, B like boy, U R T like Tom, O N.com. Just in case people don't understand me, Damon. And like money. I'm going to start using that. <laughs> <laughs> and also, definitely take advantage of his free Facebook group. That's ways to rank.com slash Facebook. W A Y S. Is that correct? Ways yeah, and you can screw up the two every possible way, and I got them all <laughs> registered. <laughs> it's funny you say that because I just literally wrote the number two in That'll my work. notes. Okay, work. <laughs> really noted. Now, as a, again, everyone, we will have links to all of the resources that Damon was so kind enough to share with us in the show notes at businessinfrastructure.tv. You'll also be able to see a video version of this interview on YouTube. The link will also be available at businessinfrastructure.tv. Thank you so much for tuning in. Remember, stay focused, be encouraged. This entrepreneurial journey is a marathon and not a sprint. Until the next time. Thank you for listening to Business Infrastructure, the podcast about curing back office blues with Alicia Butler-Pierre. If you like what you've heard, do us a favor and subscribe, leave a rating and review, and more importantly, share with your colleagues and team members who could benefit from the information. Join us next week for another episode of Business Infrastructure with Alicia Butler-Pierre.